And now, Chapter 31, Deliverance of Pondrak and the King of Kashi. The story of King Pondrak is very interesting because there have always been many rascals and fools who have considered themselves God. Even in the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, there was such a foolish person. His name was Pondrak, and he wanted to declare himself God. While Lord Balaram was absent in Vrindavan, this King Pondrak, the king of the Karush province, being foolish and puffed up, sent a messenger to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is accepted as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But King Pondrak directly challenged Krishna through the messenger, who stated that Pondrak, not Krishna, was Vasudev. In the present day, there are many foolish followers of such rascals. Similarly, in Pondrak's day, many foolish men accepted Pondrak as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because he could not estimate his own position, Pondrak falsely thought himself to be Lord Vasudev. Thus the messenger declared to Krishna that out of his causeless mercy, King Pondrak, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, had descended on earth just to deliver all distressed persons. Surrounded by many other foolish persons, this rascal Pondrak had actually concluded that he was Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This kind of conclusion is certainly childish. When children are playing, they sometimes create a king amongst themselves, and the child selected thinks that he is the king. Similarly, many foolish persons, due to ignorance, select another fool as God, and then the rascal considers himself God, as if God could be created by childish play or by the votes of men. Under this false impression, thinking himself the Supreme Lord, Pondrak sent his messenger to Dvorka to challenge the position of Krishna. The messenger reached the royal assembly of Krishna in Dvorka and conveyed the message given by his master, Pondrak. The message contained the following statements. I am the only Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudev. No man can compete with me. I have descended as King Pondrak, taking compassion on the distressed, conditioned souls, out of my unlimited, causeless mercy. You have falsely taken the position of Vasudev, without authority. But you should not propagate this false idea. You must give up your position. O descendant of the Yadu dynasty, please give up all the symbols of Vasudev, which you have falsely assumed. And after giving up this position, come and surrender unto me. If out of your gross impudence you do not care for my words, then I challenge you to fight. I am inviting you to a battle in which the decision will be settled. When all the members of the royal assembly, including King Ugrasen, heard this message sent by Pondrick, they laughed very loudly for a considerable time. After enjoying the loud laughter of all the members of the assembly, Krishna replied to the messenger as follows. O messenger of Pondrick, you may carry my message to your master. He is a foolish rascal. I directly call him a rascal, and I refuse to follow his instructions. I shall never give up the symbols of Vasudev, especially my disc. I shall use this disc to kill not only King Pondrak, but all his followers also. I shall destroy this Pondrak and his foolish associates, who merely constitute a society of cheaters, 
and cheated. O foolish king, you will then have to conceal your face in disgrace, and when your head is severed from your body by my disc, it will be surrounded by meat-eating birds like vultures, hawks, and eagles. At that time, instead of becoming my shelter, as you have demanded, you will be subject to the mercy of these low-born birds. At that time, your body will be thrown to the dogs who will eat it with great pleasure. The messenger carried the words of Lord Krishna to his master, Poundruk, who patiently heard all these insults. Without waiting any longer, Lord Krishna immediately started out on his chariot to punish the rascal Poundruk. Because at that time the king of Karush was living with his friend, the king of Kashi, Krishna surrounded the whole city of Kashi. King Pondrick was a great warrior, and as soon as he heard of Krishna's attack, he came out of the city with two Akshohini divisions of soldiers, over 400,000 strong. The king of Kashi was also a friend of King Pondrick, and he came out with three Akshohini divisions, or about 600,000 men. When the two kings came before Lord Krishna to oppose him, Krishna saw Pondrick face to face for the first time. Krishna saw that Poundruk had decorated himself with the symbols of the conch shell, disc, lotus, and club. He carried the Shanga bow, and on his chest was the insignia of Sri Vatsa. His neck was decorated with a false Kastuba jewel, and he wore a flower garland in exact imitation of Lord Vasudev. He was dressed in yellow silken garments, and the flag on his chariot carried the symbol of Garuda, exactly imitating Krishna's. He had a very valuable helmet on his head, and his earrings, like swordfish, glittered brilliantly. On the whole, however, his dress and makeup were clearly imitation. Anyone could understand that he was just like someone on stage playing the part of Vasudev in false dress. When Lord Sri Krishna saw Pandrak imitating his posture and dress, he could not check his laughter, and thus he laughed with great satisfaction. The soldiers on the side of King Pandrak began to shower their weapons upon Krishna. The weapons, including various kinds of tridents, clubs, poles, lances, swords, daggers, and arrows came flying in waves, and Krishna counteracted them. He smashed not only the weapons, but also the soldiers and assistants of Pondrak, just as during the dissolution of this universe, the fire of devastation burns everything to ashes. The elephants, chariots, horses, and infantry belonging to the opposite party were scattered by the weapons of Krishna. The whole battlefield became scattered with the bodies of animals and chariots. There were fallen horses, elephants, men, asses and camels. Although the devastated battlefield appeared like the dancing place of Lord Shiva at the time of the dissolution of the world, the warriors on the side of Krishna were very much encouraged by seeing this and they fought with greater strength. At this time, Lord Krishna told Pondrak, Pondrak, you requested me to give up the symbols of Lord Vishnu, specifically my disc. Now I will give it up to you. Be careful. You falsely declare yourself Vasudev, imitating me. Therefore, no one is a greater fool than you. From this statement of Krishna's, it is clear that any rascal who advertises himself as God is the greatest fool in human society. Krishna continued, Now Pandrak, 
I shall force you to give up this false representation. You wanted me to surrender unto you. Now this is your opportunity. We shall now fight, and if I am defeated and you are victorious, I shall certainly surrender unto you. In this way, after chastising Pondrock very severely, he smashed Pondrock's chariot to pieces by shooting an arrow. With the help of his disc, he separated Pondrock's head from his body, just as Indra shaves off the peaks of mountains by striking them with his thunderbolts. Similarly, he also killed the king of Kashi with his arrows. Lord Krishna specifically arranged to throw the head of the king of Kashi into the city of Kashi itself so that his relatives and family members could see it. Krishna did this just as a hurricane carries a lotus petal here and there. Lord Krishna killed Pondrak and his friend Kashiraj on the battlefield and then he returned to his capital city, Dvorka. When Lord Krishna returned to the city of Dvorka, all the Siddhas from the heavenly planets were singing the glories of the Lord. As far as Pondrak was concerned, somehow or other, he always thought of Lord Vasudev by falsely dressing himself in that way. And therefore Pondrak achieved Sarupya, one of the five kinds of liberation, and was thus promoted to the Vaikuntha planets where the devotees have the same bodily features as Vishnu, with four hands holding the four symbols. Factually, his meditation was concentrated on the Vishnu form, but because he thought himself Lord Vishnu, it was offensive. After being killed by Krishna, however, that offense was mitigated. Thus he was given Sarupya liberation, and he attained the same form as the Lord. When the head of the king of Kashi was thrown to the city gate, people gathered and were astonished to see that wonderful thing. When they found out that there were earrings on it, they could understand that it was someone's head. They conjectured as to whose head it might be. Some thought it was Krishna's head, because Krishna was the enemy of Kashi Raj, and they calculated that the king of Kashi might have thrown Krishna's head into the city so that the people might take pleasure in the enemies being killed. But they finally detected that the head was not Krishna's, but that of Kashiraj himself. When this was ascertained, the queens of the king of Kashi immediately approached and began to lament the death of their husband. Our dear Lord, they cried, upon your death, we have just become like dead bodies. The king of Kashi had a son whose name was Sudakshin. After observing the ritualistic funeral ceremonies, he took a vow that since Krishna was the enemy of his father, he would kill Krishna and in this way liquidate his debts to his father. Therefore, accompanied by a learned priest qualified to help him, he began to worship Mahadev, Lord Shiva. The Lord of the Kingdom of Kashi is Vishvanath, or Lord Shiva. The temple of Lord Vishvanath is still existing in Varanasi, and many thousands of pilgrims still gather daily in that temple. By the worship of Sudakshin, Lord Shiva was very much pleased, and he wanted to give a benediction to his devotee. Sudakshin's purpose was to kill Krishna, and therefore he prayed for a specific power by which to kill him. Lord Shiva advised that Sudakshin, assisted by the Brahmins, execute the ritualistic ceremony for killing one's enemy. This ceremony is also mentioned in some of the tantras. Lord Shiva informed Sudakshin that if such a black ritualistic ceremony were performed properly, 
then the evil spirit named Dakshinagni would appear to carry out any order given to him. He would have to be employed, however, to kill someone other than a qualified Brahmin. In such a case, he would be accompanied by Lord Shiva's ghostly companions, and the desire of seduction to kill his enemy would be fulfilled. When seduction was encouraged by Lord Shiva in that way, he was sure that he would be able to kill Krishna. With a determined bow of austerity, he began to execute the black art of chanting mantras, assisted by the priests. After this, out of the fire came a great demoniac form, whose hair, beard, and mustache were exactly the color of hot copper. This form was very big and fierce. As the demon arose from the fire, cinders of fire emanated from the sockets of his eyes. The giant fiery demon appeared still more fierce due to the movements of his eyebrows. He exhibited long, sharp teeth and sticking out his tongue, licked both sides of his lips. He was naked and he carried a big trident blazing like fire. After appearing from the fire of sacrifice, he stood wielding the trident in his hand. Instigated by seduction, the demon proceeded towards the capital city, Dvorka, with many hundreds of ghostly companions, and it appeared that he was going to burn all outer space to ashes. The surface of the earth trembled because of his striking steps. When he entered the city of Dvorka, all the residents panicked just like the animals in a forest fire. At that time, Krishna was playing chess in the Royal Assembly Council Hall. All the residents of Dvorka approached and addressed him. Dear Lord of the Three Worlds, a great fiery demon is ready to burn the whole city of Dvorka. Please save us. Thus, after approaching Lord Krishna, all the inhabitants of Dvorka appealed to him for protection from the fiery demon who had just appeared in Dvorka to devastate the whole city. Lord Krishna, who specifically protects his devotees, saw that the whole population of Dvorka was most perturbed by the presence of the great fiery demon. He immediately began to smile and assure them, Don't worry, I shall give you all protection. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is all-pervading. He is within everyone's heart and is without also in the form of the cosmic manifestation. He could understand that the fiery demon was a creation of Lord Shiva and in order to vanquish him, he took his Sudarshan Chakra and ordered him to take the necessary steps. The Sudarshan Chakra appeared with the effulgence of millions of suns, the heat being as powerful as the fire created at the end of the cosmic manifestation. By his own effulgence, the Sudarshan Chakra began to illuminate the entire universe on the surface of the earth as well as in outer space. Then the Sudarshan Chakra began to freeze the fiery demon created by Lord Shiva. In this way, the fiery demon was checked by the Sudarshan Chakra of Lord Krishna, and being defeated in his attempt to devastate the city of Dvorka, he turned back. Having failed to set fire to Dvorka, he went back to Varanasi, the kingdom of Kashiraj. As a result of his return, all the priests who had helped instruct the black art of mantras, along with their employer's seduction, were burned to ashes by the glaring effulgence of the fiery demon. According to the methods of black art mantras instructed in the Tantra, if the mantra fails to kill the enemy, then, because it must kill someone, it kills the original creator. 
Seduction was the originator, and the priests assisted him. Therefore, all of them were burned to ashes. This is the way of the demons. The demons create something to kill God, but by the same weapon, the demons themselves are killed. Following just behind the fiery demon, the Sudarshan Chakra also entered Varanasi. This city of Varanasi had been very opulent and great for a very long time. Even now the city of Varanasi is opulent and famous, and it is one of the important cities of India. There were then many big palaces, assembly houses, marketplaces and gates with large and very important monuments by the palaces and gates. Lecturing platforms could be found at each and every crossing of the roads. There were buildings that housed the treasury, elephants, horses, chariots and grains, and places for distribution of foodstuff. The city of Varanasi had been filled with all these material opulences for a very long time. But because the king of Kashi and his son Sudakshin were against Lord Krishna, the Vishnu Chakra, Sudarshan, the disc weapon of Lord Krishna, devastated the whole city by burning all these important places. This excursion was more ravaging than modern bombing. The Sudarshan Chakra, having thus finished his duty, came back to his lord, Sri Krishna, at Dvorka. This narration of the devastation of Varanasi by Krishna's disc weapon, the Sudarshan Chakra, is transcendental and auspicious. Anyone who narrates or hears this story with faith and attention will be released from all reaction to sinful activities. This is the assurance of Shukdev Goswami, who narrated this story to Parikshit Maharaj. Thus ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of the second volume, 31st chapter of Krishna, Deliverance of Pondrak and the King of Kashi. Hare, hare, hare.